Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of rundown new horse towns where the church is the backbone, loves in the plow, and the five string melodies grooving. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep, beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the South are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, Please go to MyBigfootSighting.com. My Bigfoot Sightings began in 1993. I remember how 25 seconds changed my entire life. Everything that's happened since then has been really based upon that moment on April 3rd in 1993. It was that day that I was a sergeant in the Oregon Army National Guard's 1249th Combat Engineer Unit. And being a combat engineer, our job entailed using a lot of high explosives in our training as well as in combat. On this particular day, a sunny Saturday in the Oregon Coast Range of Clatsop County, we had permission to utilize some gravel quarries on private timber land. And it was there that we would use three different rock quarries to do these training exercises, each one being a little bit different than the other, different uh, training scenarios, if you will. The first site was a uh, cutting charge scenario where we would use C4 plastic explosive to blow steel I-beams in half, simulating, for instance, us dropping a bridge, for instance. We did that successfully, checked our work, and moved on to the second site. It was at the second site that we had a minefield breach to do. That is to say that uh, there were a number of inert training mines that were laid out across this quarry, and our job was to take two squads, move into that area, run a ring main of debt cord and branch off of that, placing packets of C4 next to each mine. And uh, upon detonation, clearing a lane through this minefield for movement elements to transition through the minefield. That accomplished, we moved on to the third and final site. There we had a cratering charge to do. Now, a cratering charge is designed to basically blow a road in half, thereby denying the enemy use of that avenue of egress. So we, at that site, had 250 pounds of ammonium nitrate that we had been soaking in diesel fuel for several hours. And we emplaced those in the quarry, put our blasting caps and timing fuse into them, and lit the fuses. Uh, Standard operating procedure obviously required us to get into our vehicles and leave the area as quickly as possible. It was when we boarded our vehicles, there were five in all, that I took up a position behind the driver of a Humvee in the second vehicle. Upon orders, we began to descend the hill, putting distance between ourselves and the impending explosion. It was a nice day in April for the coast range, and so I had the window down, and being an avid hunter, fisherman, hiker in that area, it was just natural for me to look around the countryside and just spot for whatever wildlife I can see, being a deer, elk, bear, whatever. Well, we started going down this real narrow logging road and took a wide sweeping right-hand turn. And as we did, the brush cleared away and I had a direct view of the second blast site where we had detonated that minefield breach perhaps an hour earlier. And when we did that, 
I noticed three dark figures standing right out in the middle of this rock quarry. Now, if you can picture, the rock quarry itself was made up of basalt, so it's a real light kind of a cement gray color. But these three figures were really dark in color. I, I dare say they were they were black, dark, very dark brown at the least. But that contrast between those figures and that rock was very stark. Our standard operating procedure is that we had 100% accountability of everyone. That is to say that everybody involved in the exercise was within sight of the main body. And yet here were these three figures. Well, I barely got the thought out of my head. I mean, I, I just, I was like, what the heck are those people that I realized really before I could finish the thought that what I was looking at were not people at all. And by that, I mean, these three figures were certainly standing on two legs and they were all facing our convoy across the ravine. But that's pretty much where their description departs that of, of humans because their silhouette was way off. For instance, these, these arms were way disproportionately too long for a human. They literally reached down to their knees at, at least. And, uh, then there was the legs were, again, disproportionately too long compared to the torso. Now, in describing these things, they didn't have a stitch of clothing on them, which I would have easily been able to ascertain from that distance. But they were built like bodybuilders, if you will. Every one of them, all three of them. They were extremely wide shoulders, barrel chested. You could make out a, a, a tapered waist down below the the chest area, the head seemed to sit squarely on the shoulders as well. There was no real visual sign of a neck. Again, just like you would picture a bodybuilder. Now, the one in the middle was the tallest of the three. I would estimate it between eight and nine feet in height. The two that flanked it on its left and right came up to its shoulders. So I would estimate easily seven feet in height were those two. Now, while the one in the middle stood there like a statue, these two either side of it were engaged in this rocking motion uh, as if they were shifting their weight from foot to foot. And in the process, these long pendulous arms were swinging down below their knees. And they exhibited this behavior the entire time I watched them. And by time, I mean, this was not a two or three or five or even 10 second something ran in front of my car. I think it was a Bigfoot sort of scenario. In this case, I watched them for a full 25 seconds, which doesn't seem like a long time. But I mean, if you just stare at your watch for 25 seconds and imagine seeing what I was seeing, it seemed like an eternity. Well, eventually... We took a corner to where I lost sight of them, and and I just fell back in my seat. And, and you know, you can imagine I, my head was just reeling with a hundred questions, not the least of which is the fact that, oh my God, these things do exist. You know, growing up in the Pacific Northwest, you can't help but hear stories of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. But I'd kind of written it off as just like a campfire tale, you know, to scare the kids. <laughs> Having, again, hunted and hiked and fished in that area quite often, surely I would have seen something. So, the you know, one of the thoughts that raced in my head was these things just didn't appear on the scene. Those 25 seconds, they obviously had been there for a while and for who knows how long, hundreds, thousands of years. I don't know. The fact that I hadn't seen them is what just kind of rocked my world. Well, it would be about a long 30 seconds before we got down to the staging area where we waited for the explosion and again went back to check our work. And as soon as I dismounted from this Humvee, I just instinctively started jogging back up in the direction we came as the rest of the vehicles were coming into the staging area. I went as far as I dare. As I mentioned, we had this 100% accountability 
rule, which did not permit me to go any farther than I could still be in sight for obvious safety reasons. So I went as far as I could and I tried my best to get another view of that quarry. But unfortunately, there was a bit of a berm, if you will, blocking my view of the quarry. And I'm standing on my tiptoes. I got my hand up to my brow. I'm straining to see anything I can possibly see when I heard somebody yell out my name. I heard, hey, niece, and I look over to my right, and uh, there's Sergeant Martin looking at me and, and heading in my direction, and he, he yells out, what you looking at? Well, I dropped my hand to my side, and I replied, I don't, nothing, nothing. And he, he just continued coming up my way. I remember he was smoking on a cigarette at the time, and he got right up to where I was, looked me right in the eye, and he goes, I don't suppose you saw what I saw down at that second site. Well, being the brave guy I am, I just said, I don't know, Jeff, what did you see? <laughs> you know, I don't know what he saw, but I, I suspected it was what I had. Well, he took a long drag off his cigarette, and he looked to his left and to his right and made sure nobody else was within earshot. And he looked, locked eyes with me, and he said, oh, I saw three huge hair-covered, and he paused, and then he just said, Bigfoot, I guess. And, of course, at that, I, I said, well, yeah, I, Jeff, I saw them, too. And, uh, you know, it was great to have that corroboration because at the time I thought I was the only one that had seen them. You know, that being said, had I not had the corroboration, it certainly wouldn't have changed anything for me. I can't unsee what I saw that day. And in fact, if I close my eyes right now, I can see it just as clear as day. Those 25 seconds uh, are forever seared in my memory. Well, it would be about a month later that two more soldiers would come forward and independently confirm that they also had seen it. So I guess it begs the question whether how many people had actually witnessed it and kept their mouths shut, as I had pretty much decided shortly after seeing them. I mean, you see something that's scientifically and historically important. And you want to say something, but at the same time, it's like, who are you going to tell? First of all, I mean, the Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service, police, I don't know, zookeeper. I, bottom line is, I couldn't prove what I had seen. So who's going to believe me anyway? The other part of that is that, again, I was in the Army National Guard, and a traditional guardsman drills or trains one week in the month and then two weeks during the year for annual training. But we all have day jobs. And in my case, I was a vice president of a shipping company, a family man, non-commissioned officer in the army. And I've worked hard for my, my reputation. And I realized that with just one sentence, I could blow that. And, uh, it's kind of a blessing and a curse, if you will, because you feel very blessed. Like, I mean, you, it's like winning the lottery, but you can't spend it. You know what I mean? It's like, what, what where are you going to go with this? You know, and for so many people, this is the case. And we speculate that probably nine out of 10 people that have seen these things that have had actual visual encounters, keep it to themselves which is unfortunate. So that is the extent of my 93 encounter and the beginning of my research. And I've been researching for over 30 years since. And it's been a fantastic journey, to be honest with you. Again, it, it just confounds me how everything that's happened since that day, in one way, shape or another, goes back to that that encounter, that epiphany that I had on that sunny Saturday morning in the Coast Range. Since then, I've 
had other encounters. Bear in mind that encounters come in different forms. For instance, I've had a number of vocal encounters. I've heard these things sound off on numerous times. And by that, I mean the vocalizations they put off are not only extremely powerful, very loud in most cases, but they're the kind that you can't associate any other animal, any other known animal, as having the capability of making. So this has happened numerous times, and I'll touch back on that. Other encounters, this uh, phenomenon known as tree knocking, I can assure you does happen. Why it happens, I have my own theories, but I've heard it myself, and uh, a lot of people experience that tree knocking phenomenon in their encounters. And uh, I've had trees, full size trees, literally pushed down. Trees that defy reason. Um, I can think of one time, and this actually followed a, a knock that preceded it, uh, a very loud knock that sounded like two wooden bats being smacked together out in the middle of nowhere. Well, probably about a half hour after that and the sun had set, mind you, I'm camping at a, an old hunting camp at the time. We heard this this tree coming down. I mean, it wasn't just like you heard it hit, you heard it falling. And it was in the middle of the forest on a clear sunny day with no wind and deep in the forest, not like it was on the edge of the woods where perhaps wind could have had an effect on it. But again, there was no wind that day at all. But right after about a half hour after we heard that really loud tree knock, we heard this tree come down and, and hit the ground with a thump. I mean, you could literally feel the vibration in the ground. So there's those kinds of encounters as well. There's even such thing as a smell encounter, and I've had one of those. And personally, I hope I never have it again because it was one of the most obnoxious, foul, putrid smells I've, I've ever smelled. And what was interesting in, in this case was... I was contacted through a third party about a gentleman who had gone up the Roaring River, which is the tributary to the Clackamas River, not far from where I live. And uh, this gentleman had gone hiking up this river about a mile. And mind you, there weren't any trails. You pretty much had to bushwhack your way there. And he was an amateur rock hound and he knew that about a mile upstream there was a lava flow that crossed the roaring river and when the summer came and the water dropped it exposed a good portion of that lava flow and embedded in that lava flow was what they call common opal so his goal was to go up there with his dog he had a full-size australian shepherd with him he hiked in together and he went down to get to work on that lava bed and it was while he was down there, uh, metal hammer, metal chisel, you can imagine the sound of this metal on metal being very unusual back in, the, in this wilderness area. Well, it attracted attention. He first noticed uh, when his dog started acting up, the dog was further above him looking into the woods and growling and, and not so much barking, but growling. And he just assumed, hey, they've got a raccoon or a squirrel or something's bugging them, but it, that's not unusual. But what was unusual is that this went on for nearly 10 minutes before he finally decided to put down his chisel and his hammer and go investigate what had the dog so riled. When he got up there, he looked in the direction the dog was looking and growling and by his own words, he didn't say Bigfoot. He said I saw a gorilla standing on a log, holding onto a tree, on two legs, looking right at my dog with a pretty mean look on its face and with every breath it would grunt. So it was kind of a standoff. 
between it and the dog. And uh, once he saw this, he shoved the dog off the log and they ran again, no trail. They just bushwhacked faster. It took them an hour to get in there. It took them maybe 20 minutes to get out. And what's really unusual about it is this thing actually took chase, which is not your classical reaction for most Bigfoot. Generally, when a Bigfoot realizes that it's been compromised, they simply turn around and walk off. And mind you, they, they're they curious about us, and they watch us quite a bit. And you wouldn't even know it. But suffice to say, I believe they know more about us than we do about them. Anyhow, we were asked to come in and investigate. And so I and a friend met up with this gentleman, and, and we hiked the hour walk just to go in a mile. It's pretty rough going, but just based on his story and the fact that this animal basically escorted them out of the area, both Steve and I were packing just for protection. Well, sure enough, when we got there, there was his hammer and chisel two weeks later, still sitting on the on the bed of lava, as lo- along with his little collection bag. So he picked those up. We checked the area out. We uh, measured the distance from where he was standing and this gorilla was standing, and it was only 47 feet. So it was it was a pretty close encounter. We looked for tracks, but the substrate just wasn't conducive to taking footprints. There was a lot of duff, a lot of rock, but we did the best we could in about 30 minutes when we were there. And then we took some photos, he got his stuff, and we headed back out to the same way we came. Now, what's interesting is we passed this one spot not far from where we conducted this investigation. We had passed it maybe 30 minutes earlier. Well, heading back, all of us walked into this wall of smell. And I say wall because this smelled worse than any skunk you've ever smelled. I mean, it smelled like rotting meat, almost like a a roadkill would smell after a week or two. What's strange is it wasn't there 30 minutes earlier. And again, by wall, I'm telling you, you know, you come around a skunk kill on a road, you can smell it a quarter of a mile before you get there. And sometimes that much after you pass it, it's pretty rancid. But in this case, as powerful as that smell was, and maybe some of y'all can understand, is that we walked into it. And it was immediately strong. And you could take 10 steps backwards and not smell a thing. I have never understood it to this day. I've never seen any sort of a smell that was so concentrated and focused in one spot to where you could literally walk through it. And 20, 30 feet out the other side of it, you couldn't smell it. But you, when you were in it, you were in it and you knew it. And it was it was disgusting. We We took the time just for the sake of research to do a scan of the area we we walked this grid search through 360 degrees around where this smell was and we, we failed to find any source of it and i have no doubt based upon interviews i've conducted over the years with other people who dealt with this smell that that's exactly what we smelled the same description as well as that whole centralized concentrated smell experience So there's a lot of different encounters. So obviously, the Holy Grail is to actually see them. And like I said, on April 3rd, 1993, I saw three of them. Well, in 2000, I was invited by some tribal members of the Omaha Indian Reservation to to fly out there and... uh, They had told me that they, over the course of about three years, had established a relationship with a clan of these things, and that they would go out at nighttime and literally call them in. And the way you knew they were there was that 
well, a couple things. One is that classic I shine, I guess what people call it. I personally believe it to be a refraction of zodiac and lunar light, light that normally we as humans are unable to see. But I think they have the ability, like most animals with night vision, they have a tapetum in the back. It's called the tapetum in the back of the eye between the optic nerve and the retina that is reflective. And what it does is it actually magnifies that uh, light to the point where we can actually now see it. But I would I, I'd put that there in the supernatural category, the paranormal category, only because my first go-to when somebody claims that these creatures, this species has a some sort of a unique characteristic, my first go-to is, all right, show me one other animal that has that capability that we know of, and then we've got a starting point. But because of my really lack of knowledge and, and more to the point, lack of experience of this phenomena, I kind of written it off, but I thought I'll go out there and as a courtesy, finally meet these people in person. So we got out there and they took me to this location, very remote on the reservation, not far from the, the Missouri River. So if you can picture the Missouri River separates Iowa and Nebraska. And I mean, if anybody had asked me, name five states that would not support Bigfoot, I think Nebraska would be right up in there. I always thought it was all flat cornfields, but right there along the Missouri, there are these rolling hills with very dense hardwood forests. And this is where they took me. So we went out on a Monday night, the first night, I recall. And uh, there was only one spot to pull off of the road. It was just a one, one lane each direction, and it was very remote. And this was during the height of COVID. So the reservation itself was in lockdown. So there shouldn't have been anybody else out anyway. But I have a healthy skepticism when dealing with any sort of... Uh, encounter experiences. I try to keep an open mind, but I'm always looking for any sign of a uh, hoax or whatnot, but be that as it may with the, with the reservation lockdown and, and we never passed a single vehicle going out there. And the fact it was midnight told me that we were very, very alone. So we parked the car, turned off all the lights. And I mean, we didn't even have cell phone light. We didn't have camera lights. We didn't have anything. We just, we walked across this road. And uh, my native friend cups his hands through his mouth and, and yells out, Oh, ho! Kage! Which in Omaha language means, hello, friends. And we sat there, five seconds, 10 seconds went by, and again, he repeats his call. And I'm here to tell you, within about 15 more seconds, all of a sudden, two lights appear that, for all intents and purposes, look like eyes to me. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, is this what I think it is? And he's like, yeah, that's them. And over the course of the week, and we went out five nights in a row, we would have as many as three at a time. And they moved independent of each other. They moved to the left. They moved to the right. They moved forward in some cases. They backed off in others. But it was just amazing to witness. And I'm talking these thighs blinked. They turned side to side. But it wasn't just the eyes shine alone. It was the vocalizations the, uh, that accompanied it that really hooked me. It was it was interesting that it was Monday night when we got there that we were greeted shortly after these eyes started coming on. We were greeted with what I can only call a, a, a song. Out in the distance, probably at least 100 yards away, we hear this very loud, very high-pitched, 
voice, if you will, that put off this five to six second long chorus. And by that, I mean, it just, it changed notes, it changed pitch, it changed volume, and it was beautiful. It wasn't scary at all. In fact, it sounded quite welcoming. Well, there would be a 10 second gap, and then she did it again. And she did it exactly the same way that she did the first round. Another 10 seconds would go by and she sounded off again. And then, and, and she sounded off probably, well, four times in within a minute. And, uh, it was amazing. Three days later during the daylight, I kind of snuck out there wanting to see what things looked like in the daylight, went out there on my own. And, uh, I'm thinking, these things got to sleep sometimes. So I, so I just assumed they were nocturnal and bedded down for the day. But no sooner did I walk up to the area where I suspected they were standing, this same individual does the same thing, this time only once, but again, exactly note for note, the same chorus which totally caught me off guard. Now, anytime it comes to any animal repeating the same sounds, as opposed to some arbitrary scream or yell, if you will, or whoop, that tells me language. That tells me there's got to be meaning involved in it. And I guess if I could assign any sort of meaning behind that chorus it was welcome it, it sounded very welcoming to me anyway I, it did not put me off did not scare me in the least bit but after hearing it i decided to acknowledge it and exit the area and i'd gotten probably about less than 50 feet away back on my way back to my rental car when i heard six very loud tree knocks in very rapid succession coming from the opposite direction. Well, that just kind of hurried me up even more because that didn't sound quite as friendly as that little song. But anyway, so that in 30 years was the only times I've actually seen them. But again, I've been very close to it from time to time. And I found plenty of evidence in the form of tracks and scat and hair and casted a lot of tracks. And But it's been uh, quite a journey for me. And I'll keep looking for as long as I'm alive. Because I have to look back on this thing. Like, you know, like I said, it's like a lottery, if you will. The odds of me seeing them at all especially under the circumstances. I mean, my God, we were blowing up their forest. We're a million to one. And so I think, you know, if we had drove through there five minutes later or five minutes earlier, would I have even seen them? So I kind of turned my research efforts into a, a purpose. I've, I've had to really for my own cathartic reasons. There's got to be a purpose in why I was allowed to see what I saw. And so in 2015, I established a nonprofit organization called the American Primate Conservancy. And as the name denotes, conservation is our goal. My concern is, as elusive as these things are, and as rarely as they're seen, there's always the chance that this species may be threatened, if not endangered. They may be perfectly healthy, as far as I know, but I'd rather err on the side of caution. And so what we at the Conservancy do is, our goal is to get them scientifically recognized, officially, taxonomically named, 
and then get protections put in place, some laws that'll ensure that not only myself, but my kids, my grandkids, generations to come will have a chance to see what I experienced. And so with that, the main goal, again, is to get them recognized. And in order to do that, we have to get evidence, evidence strong enough to raise their existence to the level of being accepted by the scientific community. That's a tall task in itself. Now, once they are, obvious next step is to try to afford some protections in the event anybody wants to harass, harm, or kill one. Because, frankly, right now it's open season. There's nothing out there that prevents anybody from killing one of these things, and I'd hate to see that happen. Now, I know some people in the past have tried to bring this to the attention of the authorities. In the case of the United States, it would be the Department of the Interior, who has uh, jurisdiction over the Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife and other agencies. And every effort has fallen flat on its face. And I know, too, that others of our Canadian brothers have done the same thing attempted that, I should say, uh, with the Canadian version of the Department of the Interior. And so what we're trying to do is kind of come at it through the back door, if you will. One of the things that I found very interesting in my research is the Native American lore with regards to this. You know, when I first saw them, my Initial thing was to go to the library and check out every book I can find on the subject. I wasn't interested in the least prior to this. I didn't watch any TV show, didn't read any books, was really wasn't interested. Now I'm interested. So I, I walked out with a stack of books, at least as many as they had let me take, and I digested those pretty quick. And And I think it was about six months into my research when it just dawned on me one day. I'm like, you know... All these books were written by white people and Westerners, people who have only been on this in North America for maybe 300 years. And yet here we have an indigenous population of numerous tribes that we know, now know have existed here for 21 to 23,000 years. So who do you think has more information on these things? Pioneers, trappers, Explorers, you bet. But Native Americans, they've had to live symbiotically with these things all this time. And so rather than look for the newest information I can find, I've endeavored to find some of the oldest information I can find, information that is literally prehistoric, in that the natives didn't have any written language. And in the process, I've been fortunate enough to befriend a number of Native Americans and earn their trust. And that's really key to learning more about what they know as well. And trust me, they know a lot. So I've discovered reading really old archives, archives that were been kept in the Smithsonian, reading uh, historical pieces, journals from early explorers. And there's a wealth of information out there that far exceeds what's going on today. So my thought is this, if, and this is part of Native American culture, and it seems to transcend every tribe. They all may have a different name for them, but they all are describing the very same species or creature. Now they don't refer to them like they would a common animal. It's interesting how they talk about the owl and the raven and the coyote and the bear. But when they discuss these things, they talk about them as a, another tribe. In fact, they often refer to them as the old ones or the first ones. And that's really all you need to know. They were here before we were, is what they're saying. When we came on the scene, say, maybe 23,000 years ago, this tribe of giant 
hominids, which would be my guess, a relic hominid similar to that of Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, but a different branch that somehow survived when they all went extinct. But they literally refer to them as an ancient tribe and respect them as such. So with that in mind, and the fact that it's really deeply ingrained in their culture, I've decided that through the auspices of the Conservancy that we would take that back door, if you will, and approach these reservations, these tribes that have established reservations, knowing that they have autonomy on those reservations. In fact, they're considered independent nations within our nation. And they get to make their own rules as it regards daily life, as well as wildlife conservation and hunting and fishing practices and what have you. So I have drafted an act, if you will, and basically made it plug and play, put your tribal name in, put whatever you call them in. For instance, the one for the Omaha tribe is called the... Omaha Nation Satonga Protection Act, and Satonga is what they call them there. And it's about a two-page draft that basically spells out legal ramifications. If anyone were to harass, harm, injure, or kill a Satonga on their reservation, along with a monetary fines and possible imprisonment. So, I'm working currently with about five tribes, and I'm hoping that once we get them on board, that we're going to have a way then. I think it'll spread like wildfire. There's nearly 100 reservations in North America to include the U.S. and Canada. And uh, if we can get them on board, because, again, it bolsters their cultural beliefs. It puts in place, because they do understand this tribe still exists to this day it puts in place protections so it's a win-win once we get a few dozen of these reservations on board then it's going to be a lot easier sell to take to the department of the interior and go look i know you're concerned about appearances and especially your accountable taxpayers and they don't want to find out their taxpayer money is going to protect some mythical creature. But here, here's a whole stack of petitions or, or, or laws that are already in effect across the country. So it'll take some pressure off the Department of the Interior, both in terms of accountability, but also in terms of the, I don't know, the embarrassment factor, I guess, for them uh, even being willing to entertain the idea. But that's what we're doing within the Conservancy. That's one of our main goals is to just get some laws on the books that, you know, like I said, I want to make sure that future generations have that same, albeit rare opportunity to witness what I experienced. And anyway, with that being said, I do travel the country. I give talks at different conferences. I'm currently writing a book after 30 years. I figured it was probably time. I'm 62 years old. And so uh, I'm hoping by this spring to get that book published. And I also put on an annual event. It's not what you'd consider a conventional conference like any other, really, because it's a private invitation only event known as Beachfoot. This year will mark our 17th year, and it all was kind of a a brainchild of mine in 2008 when I thought of all the people I had met, very famous people in the field, and actually even got to share the stage with a number of them, uh, many of them now passed on. But at the time, I'm thinking, what would it be like if I could get all these people in one place at one time? I mean, the amount of knowledge and theories on this species is kept close to the chest, if you will. You know, a lot of people covet their research. There's a there's a bit of uh, jealousy and competition, if you will, which is really unfortunate. 
But ultimately, I came up with this concept that I'm going to put on this private invitation only, really a retreat, if you will, for researchers around the world, limited to 100 people. And just like I said, invitation only, no spectators, no people off the street, no media, no vendors, a break even kind of thing. We just would count heads, split the cost. And it really took on a life of its own. But I think it's important in the community in general to share our information. There's so many groups out there that are so disconnected. And I think if we're going to answer this mystery, that it's going to take a collective effort. So that's another one of the things that we do through the the conservancy. So like I said, it's changed my life. Never thought 25 seconds would take me on a whole different course, but it's a life that I wouldn't trade for anything. I feel blessed to be able to be a part of it and to meet so many wonderful people along the way. And uh, I would just encourage everybody out there to uh, keep an open mind, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open, keep your nose open. One of the things that struck me was prior to my sighting, I can't imagine how many times I've walked right past some very blatant evidence, but not being a believer, just dismissed it out of hand. Since that time, the evidence is overwhelming. It's everywhere. So I guess for those of us who've had the opportunity to see these and and go from believers to knowers, it's a bit of an advantage. But maybe just put yourself in that mindset that they do exist and keep your eyes open because the evidence is out there. They're out there. Now you get out there and do the same. Well, that's it for tonight's show. If you've had a Bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest, please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know. Thanks for listening. Have a great night. Seen a bunch of run down new horse towns where the church is the backbone loves and the plow. And the five string melodies groove in. With the farmland rows where the roots run deep. Beyond the noise of the busy streets. Where the songs of the south are soothing. When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out. I don't run from banjo music Yeah The sound of a memory brings me back To the bluegrass playing on my dad's a track His pick-up man had been through it Getting through the day on scrugs and skags Booking their bells to those Tennessee jams There's no other way that I'd do it when I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music Yeah Something on the backwards, backwards and double time Looking at the soul and the drummer of Kentucky style Those are the anthems drumming now Country boy living When I hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out
Best sweet tea kind of sound. I don't 